All right, well, it is 101, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to At Home with Moat, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. So we have three of these classes left for the season, so I hope you can join all of them. Um, again, guys, my name is uh, Dana Henderson, but you can call me Miss Dana. Everybody does, kids and adults. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking all about marine invertebrates, which is one of my absolute favorite topics. They're so cool. Um, a couple of things, guys, just if you have any questions or comments or you have any technical difficulties, if you want to type that into the chat box. We've got Miss Elena and Miss Lauren moderating, and they'll be able to answer all of your questions if I don't see your, your chat pop up. Um, so, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. I hope everybody is all ready to learn about those fearless creatures, the marine invertebrates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share your screen. Uh, for today, I have lots of fun stuff and a couple fun activities to show you. I even have a couple special guests to introduce to you today. So like always, we'll be sh I'll be sharing my screen with you, kind of going back and forth. Again, if at any time you have technical difficulties or if I freeze up or something, uh, let Miss Elena know and she will get it taken care of. All right, well, let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, everyone. Well, you know what time it is. It's time to get at home with Moat. And today it's all about at home with marine invertebrates. Now, ladies and gentlemen, marine invertebrates make up the most of all the animals on the planet. Basically, if you took all of the other animals in all the world, the land and the sea, and added, added them all together, they would not be as abundant as the marine invertebrates, which is pretty wild. So it's pretty safe to say they're very, very important. They do have a couple of threats that we'll talk about later and ways that we can actually help to conserve them. But boys and girls, before we get into marine invertebrates, it is a really great time for us to practice a very common and important scientific technique known as classification, okay? So scientists basically group of organisms based on different shared characteristics. And it's really important when you're talking about these marine invertebrates because they're so abundant and there's so many of them. So just imagine you discover a brand new species on the beach or somewhere. Using these special techniques, you can figure out what they are or at least the group that they belong to. So what is it? What is classification? It's pretty simple. It's basically just grouping things together. You guys probably do that all the time, okay? You might have all of your, you know, summer clothes together or in your pantry, you might have all of your sweet stuff together, okay? So we classify things all the time and some of you might do it a little bit more than others, depending on how organized you are. I'm not that organized, so. <laughs> uh, but you classify things in day-to-day -day life. Well, classifying organisms in science is known as taxonomy, okay? And so let's all say it together, taxonomy, let's all sing it, taxonomy. I love torturing you guys with my song. Let's say it like a robot, taxonomy. Ooh, that's a fun one, taxonomy. So taxonomy, right? The more we say it, the more we remember it. So taxonomy. Here at Moat, we use it all the time, okay? When we're out in the field, trying to figure out new species, we're trying to figure out how certain things affect certain species. So if we can kind of know some of these techniques, it's a little bit better, okay? A little bit easier. So I asked you, if you have your pre-lesson activity, okay, activity guide, I asked you to get a bunch of shells or a bunch of uh, toys or a bunch of candy, just a bunch of different things, okay? So I'm going to stop my share just for a second. And if you don't have the materials now, no worries, you can do it later, okay? So it's just a little, oh, let me turn my volume up a little bit. How's the, how's the volume, Miss Elena? All right, so I'm gonna unplug something over here, you guys. Hold please, technical difficulties. Okay, awesome, perfect. <laughs> um, so there's some simple ways that you can practice classification with just random items around your house, okay? So if you didn't gather things today, no worries, do it later. But you can kind of see an example 
I have what I like to call a classification tray. And it's a bunch of different things um, that we can um, try to classify, okay? So it's a bunch of just random stuff, okay? So I've got some shells in here, I've got some living things, I've got some non-living things, um, and all kinds of stuff going on in here, all right? So if you guys got a bunch of shells and everything, I want us to take a minute or so, okay? And see how you would classify them. So if you've got your group of shells, if you've got your group of candy, take a moment, look at your different items, and look for shared characteristics, okay? So these are the things that uh, scientists basically have observed that something shares, right? Something has in common, okay? So if um, Miss Lauren was here right now, we both have brown hair, so that would be a way to classify us, right? A shared characteristic. So look at yourself just for a second and type into the chat, some of the things your stuff has in common, okay? So I have a bunch of stuff, right? I have like a pink, like a plastic ball. I have this little gem, okay? I have a representative of a jellyfish, okay? Ooh, color, that's a good idea, okay? I have just various stuff, okay? So as we go through our class today, I'm gonna to be teaching you some different ways that scientists classify animals. And they start with a really big group called the domain. It's basically how many cells do we have, okay? I'll give you a hint. We have multi, very many cells and our marine inverts too, okay? So then we kind of go down until finally we get to the individual species. Now today we're not gonna go all the way down to the species. I am gonna introduce you to some fun species, uh, but that's a nice follow-up activity. So if you go, there's tons of activities online um, called a dichotomous key where you can actually figure out what exactly species that you have found, okay? And when we go out here in the bay and we explore animals, a lot of times we catch things that I've never seen before and it's so exciting to go back and try and figure out what it is, okay? So just think about that with your classification tray. How would you classify those? And as we go through our uh, presentation, then you might wanna change stuff around a little bit and see if you kind of classify the same way that scientists do. All right, back to share. Okay, so taxonomy, all right? And so we do have something in common with all of the animals that we're gonna learn today, and that's we're all a part of the animal kingdom, okay? So let's go through and just start with our classification activity. So the first thing, if you guys have a tray of a bunch of random stuff, check it out and see what do you think is living versus non-living, okay? Now, for today's purposes, you know, we like to use a lot of models here at Moat. Um, so I always say, if you are do using models, something that was once alive or represents something that was alive, okay? If you have a little plastic whale, obviously it's non-living, right? Um, but in this activity, it's simulating something that's alive, okay? So these are two of my favorite science words. You guys know I love to teach you new science words. So biotic means living. Let's all say it. Biotic. I'm not going to torture you with singing this time. Um, and abiotic. So if something has that uh, prefix a in front of it, that means the opposite. Bio means life in Latin, right? So biology is the study of life. Okay. So something that's biotic is living. Something that's abiotic is non-living, okay? Actually, I have my pictures kind of flip-flopped here, okay? So non-living things, non-living factors, you know, rocks, weather, water, okay? Man-made things, plastic, okay? These are all abiotic factors, okay? Now, can anyone tell me another word for something that is living or biotic? There's also another word that we use, we throw out there sometime. Give you a hint, it's something when I buy my produce, I try to make sure it's, it's, it's harvested this way or taken care of this way. 
it's organic, right? You guys got it, organic, okay? So anything that has organic matter, even if it's not currently alive, means it was once alive. A nice example of that, uh, boys and girls, would be our shells, okay? So, um, you know, shell is not currently alive, but it is made up of that organic matter, okay? So living versus non-living, good job, okay? So then once we figure out, okay, we wanna find out what are all the living things, okay? So if you guys have a bunch of your random classification stuff, take all those non-living things and just push them out of the way, okay? We're not gonna talk about those right now. So then after we're looking at our, our living things, we wanna know what is it an animal? Cause that's what a marine invertebrate is, right? It's an, it's an animal. So looking at this picture, these two pictures, which one is the animal? And what, what is the other thing on there? Pretty easy, right? I can't imagine any of you guys are confusing these two, right? So we have a beautiful flower on the left. I don't know this, the particular species. Beautiful flower on the left. And of course, an amazing lion on the right. It's easy to show right away which one's the animal and which one is the plant, right? Um, it's not always as easy when we're talking about marine invertebrates, okay? Because they're animals, but a lot of times they look like plants. So check these out. The one on the left, plant, animal, bacteria, fungus, plant, right? Those are daffodils, known as buttercups is what I grew up calling them, buttercups. And what about on the right? Animal, so there's a, there's a few things going on in this picture. But I'm talking about this guy right here. And you got it, that is an animal. That is a type of marine invertebrate known as a cnidarian, also known as a coral. So what makes an animal an animal? What do you guys think? What makes an animal an animal? Yeah, you guys got it, they have to eat, okay? So, I don't know about you all, I'm a little hungry, I don't have lunch, so talking about animals eating is making me more hungry. <laughs> uh, but animals have to eat, right? So plants can actually use the energy from the sun to photosynthesize, make their own food, okay? So animals can, they have to eat, their cells are different if you wanna get on a cellular level, and animals typically can move. Now some animals are what we, which is a great word, so please sing it if you wanna sing it. They can't get up and move around, but they can move parts of their body to grab food and that kind of thing, okay? Plants may react and move a little bit, but overall, these are our general characteristics. Now you guys may, you've probably learned this from me by now, we never say never in, uh, in um, oh, something just fell in my classroom, weird, sorry. <laughs> uh, we never say never in science, right? And we never say always, even though I just said never, shh. Okay, because there's always exceptions to the rules. So as we're going through guys and we're, we're classifying our marine inverts, no, there's always some exceptions to the rules. So our animals have to eat, okay? So look at your stuff that you have gathered and see if you have anything that you don't consider to be an animal. If you have anything like that, like I have tiny little um, palm trees, I have a leaf in my kit, I have a little plastic apple that kind of represents that. Um, so it's living, it represented organic matter, but it's not an animal. So I would push that to the side. Good job. Okay, so we now know marine invertebrates, right? They have, they're multicellular. They um, are animals, so they have to eat, they can move, okay? So what does it mean to be an invertebrate? All right, everybody take your hand, feel along your backbone, your spine, your vertebrate. Did everybody bring their bones with them to class today? No one left them home. Okay, no one's a jellyfish today. Nobody's spineless, right? So we are vertebrates, okay? Our phylum after kingdom animalia, so all those animals are in kingdom animalia, humans included, okay? So we have that in common with an octopus. Okay, after that guys, they split into different phyla or phylums. Those are the big groups, okay? 
us as humans, we are in phylum chordata, okay? So if you have anything in your classification tray that has a backbone, okay? So I have a little plastic walrus, okay? I have a tiny doll that's a human, okay? I have a turtle, okay? So I don't know if, if any of you guys were in our turtle class, but we learned that turtles actually do have backbones, okay? So I'm gonna push those all to the side, okay? And what you should be left with, okay, are some marine invertebrates, if you have any of those. If you have any shells, if you have any little pieces of coral, okay? And we're gonna practice a little bit more with that sheet that I gave you on the, on the pre-lesson activity in just a second. So we know what an invertebrate is. What's a marine invertebrate? What's this word marine mean? Yeah, it typically spends all of its life in salt water, right? At least most of its life, okay? Now there are some freshwater invertebrates, but today we're gonna be talking all about those marine critters, those animals living in the ocean that do not have a backbone that make up 97% of all animals on the planet. Wow, that's a lot. So, there are about 30 different groups of marine invertebrates, okay? And many of them are extinct. Anybody remember the word for an animal that is not extinct, that is still living today? said it a couple times in some of our programs, um, but it's so funny. It's like we always know the word nocturnal. We don't know the word diurnal, which is what most of us are living uh, active in the day. Yes, extant. Great job, guys. Extant. So extant are animals that are still alive today, okay? And so there's only about nine that are um, phyla of marine inverts that are still extant today. So many of them are extinct, okay? And there's typically six that are the most common, especially here in Sarasota Bay, that we talk about a lot, okay, that we um, find a lot. And so we like to call these the big six, the big six, okay? So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna introduce you to a couple, okay? I'm gonna show you some really fun artifacts, um, um, also known as biofacts. So biofact is an artifact that was once living, okay? And um, I want you guys to try to classify as we go through. So I'm gonna stop my share just for a second because I wanna show you, okay? Let me put my classification tray to the side. Now again, if you did not print this out, no big deal. You can just kind of follow along. But on the pre-lesson activity guide, we have this, the big six classification chart. And we're gonna go through, we're gonna learn the characteristics of each of these different marine phyla, okay? And some really fun facts. Now you also have this sheet that I asked you guys, if you had, if you had, um, access to a printer and you were able to cut these out beforehand, okay? If not, no big deal, you can still listen and learn, okay? Now, as we go through, if you have them, I'm gonna give you a sneak peek. What? Oh, why do we have SpongeBob? Good question, what do you think? It's just kind of a for fun to throw that in there. So, as we go through, if you have the cutouts, go ahead and try and classify them, okay? I wouldn't glue them down just yet, but um, you can if you feel confident about it. I'm gonna give you a hint. There's one group that is not represented. I would love to say I did it on purpose, but I didn't. And I feel really bad because I left them out, <laughs> okay? So there's one group as we go through here. So you're gonna find that when you're going through, okay? Now there's some that I threw in that are a little bit tricky that may contain more than one possibility, all right? So as we go through, think about these characteristics and see how well you can do at classifying some of these marine inverts. All right, let's go. The big six. So the first one I wanna show you guys, and again, I'm gonna kinda of go back and forth between the screen and showing you some fun stuff, is phylum periphera. Now you guys know I'm gonna have you say it out loud, periphera. You can say it however you want, but again, you say it, kinda of sticks a little bit better. Periphera, okay? These are your sponges, okay? So the main characteristics that scientists are looking at when they are classifying these animals 
are a couple different things. They're looking at their body plan, okay? Their body plan. Some animals basically are in the shape of a circle, okay? And, and have five equal parts. Some animals, like humans, have what we call bilateral symmetry, meaning they have two equal parts. If you cut me straight down the middle, I'm pretty much the same on both sides. I ask you please not to do that <laughs> because we're no periphera. One of the cool characteristics about periphera is they can regenerate. So if a little piece of sponge comes off, then the, the large piece will grow a new piece and the tiny piece will turn into a brand new sponge, okay? Now these guys don't really have a true body plan, okay? They can be all sorts of wild and weird and that kind of deal. So I will show you, I have this sponge here is, I believe it's called a cup sponge. Most of the um, sponges are named just by what they look like, okay? We have a really cool sponge out in Sarasota Bay that's named for its smell. Anybody know it before I say it? Mr. Brad, I know you know it if you're there. It's the garlic sponge. So next time you guys are out, I really hope we find some garlic sponge so we can all smell it. It smells just like garlic, okay? So typically our, spon our sponges are named for that, okay? So the neat thing about our sponges is they are porous, meaning they have many, many holes that the water can actually flow through, okay? Now we're gonna learn about another animal in a little bit that kind of has some holes but the water cannot go through it, okay? Very, very, very important to our marine ecosystem. They filter out water and um, keep, the, keep everything nice and clean. So if you like to go snorkeling, okay? In addition to the seagrass we learned about last week, there are huge areas of sponge beds and they do the same thing. They filter out all that debris floating around in our ecosystem and make things nice and um, nice and clear, okay? So our sponges. Okay, so the next one, guys, is phylum Cnidaria. Let's all say it, Cnidaria. Kind of sounds like that yogurt, Activia, when I just sang it like that. <laughs> um, you'll notice the C is silent, okay? And you'll see these are our jellyfish, our sea anemones, our coral belong to this, okay? So again, coral are animals. Now these guys have a soft body. Now most animals in the ocean, if they have a soft squishy body, they are gonna make for a nice tasty treat for all sorts of predators. So these guys, their special defense is they have these nematocysts, these steam cells, okay? So most of you probably uh, know that a jellyfish can sting, a true jellyfish can sting. If you get stung, they say the best thing to do is to exfoliate the area with sand because what happens when a jellyfish stings you, it actually injects those nematocysts in you, okay? So they're more venomous than they are poisonous, which is really interesting, okay? They say scrub it with sand, get those nematocysts off, and then put something on it that's a little more acidic that will neutralize it, like vinegar or something like that, okay? That old wives tell of peeing on it. I wouldn't do that. That's going to be really awkward at the beach if you start doing that to your friends. So take a little bottle of vinegar with you when you go to the beach and you'll be all good, okay? Uh, I've been in the beach, I want to say millions of times. That's probably an exaggeration, but I've been stung twice and I live to tell the tale. So it's not as big of a deal as you would think. <laughs> so these guys have those stinging cells and they have what's called radial symmetry. So their body plan basically makes a circle. And if you were to divide it into, it could be divided into five equal parts, almost like the shape of a star, which may give you a hint about a body plan of a different type of marine invertebrate in a little bit, okay? So our cnidarians have this soft, squishy body, radial symmetry, and of course they have those stinging cells. We've got the worms, the class and. Analyta, I can never say it right. You guys know how I always get tongue tied. Analyta, okay, so say it, Analyta, sing it, Analyta. Again, Activia. <laughs> now, under phylum, 
are the different classes when you are classifying things, okay? So for us, our class, okay, so we are in phylum chordata and then humans are in class mammalia. I hope you all said it, mammalia, okay? So marine, so the annelids, earthworms and any kind of worm, um, silkworms that you find on land are also in this phylum. But if we go down one step and we look at the class polychaetes, okay, these are your marine worms, okay? These guys have bilateral symmetry, which is like us, okay? So they have two-part symmetry. Most of them have bristles that they use. This particular worm is called a bristle, or it's called a, um, a Christmas tree worm. You can see it looks like a Christmas tree. They grow um, on coral. Many of them, especially the ones we have find out here in Sarasota Bay, they construct a tube made out of calcium. Okay, and a lot of times we'll find these on the beach. So let me show you. I'm gonna stop my share so I can show you this little guy. So if you've ever found one of these on the beach, I'm trying to get it to focus. <laughs> You'll see that um, you're like, oh, that's a weird looking snail. It's not. It's actually a tube worm uh, egg, or casing. Okay, so tube casing. So this is probably from a feather duster worm. And if you would like to make your own feather duster worm at home, it's super easy. Okay, you get yourself a toilet paper roll, you get yourself a feather duster, and there you go. Okay, and that's kind of the way that they. Um, act out in the water in the so like the sand would be here okay water here so this is underground basically they'll come out when they want to feed and then when they get scared or threatened they go back in feather dust a worm okay all right so now we're getting into the fun stuff not that these guys weren't fun don't tell them i didn't i said that but now I can introduce you to some marine inverts, okay? So this is the most abundant of all the animals in the world, basically. The phylum Arthropoda, okay? So say that for me, Arthropoda, okay? Now, if you look at these root words right here, Arth, if you think of another word that has that at the beginning, Arthritis, okay, has to do with your joints. So Arth means jointed, and pod means a foot or leg, okay? So these guys have jointed legs. So you can see one of their members is a crab, of course. And the most abundant animal on the planet is an arthropod known as krill. Yeah, the whale's favorite food, right? So krill have the most abundant biomass, meaning the weight of all those organisms together on the planet, okay? So really important to our marine ecosystem. These guys also have that bilateral symmetry, okay? And they have an exoskeleton that they have to molt, okay? So this is similar to a snake needing to shed um, its skin in order to grow, okay? Um, but snakes have a backbone, so they're not marine invertebrates. These guys are invertebrates, and when they get too big for their shell, they basically bust out of their shell, they're soft for a couple days, and then their shell will harden back up from the calcium in the water, okay? And that's why things like ocean acidification and some of these climate change threats we've talked about in the, fat, in the past can be hard for these guys. If the pH is lowered in the ocean, they can't quite get the calcium they need, okay? Um, and if you have any more questions about that, we can go into it, okay? So I just wanted to kind of touch on that, um, how they need that calcium in the water and they need that pH to be maintained in the water. Otherwise, it's really hard for them to build their shell back up, okay? Now, in a little bit, we're gonna talk about a different animal that has a shell that's very different, okay? So, so a mollusk shell grows as they grow, like our bones. These guys have to come out of their shell in order to grow, okay? So their shell is almost more like our fingernails. If we were to lose our fingernails, our fingernails grow back. Now, I like to think about molting as, imagine you guys have your favorite shirt. It is your favorite shirt. You love it. You never take it off. You literally wear it night and day, all day, every day. It's starting to stink. Your parents are getting really mad at you. They're like, can you like change that shirt? Like, what's up? but you don't, you don't want to change it. You just keep wearing it. You keep wearing it. 
what's eventually going to happen to the shirt as you grow? The shirt's gonna bust, right? There's no way that you can grow and the shirt won't grow, okay? So then you have to get a new shirt. It's kind of the same thing. So I have a little video here. It's really quick, so I might play it twice. You guys, I'm sorry. I just realized I did not start these. So if ads pop up, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Why? Sorry, guys. <laughs> One second. Skip the ad. Okay. So this is a blue crab, just like the picture that we just saw. So blue crab's an arthropod. You can see his jointed legs. The top of his body is called the carapace. Same thing that a turtle shell is called, a carapace, okay? It can be a little confusing, but this is a carapace, okay? And, um, and what's going to happen is basically you're going to see he's going to pop the back of his shell open, the back of his carapace. He's going to pull his soft body out. And then many times they turn around and they actually eat the molt, okay? It gives them a little bit of extra calcium, okay? So I'm going to start this so you can check it out. And this is time lapsed, okay? So this usually takes a couple hours. And every time they're, they molt, they are about 25% bigger. So every time they molt, they're quite a bit bigger until they reach kind of maturity and they're not gonna grow anymore. I just love it, it's so cool. Just one of, uh, they'll even molt their eyes, they'll molt every piece of their body. Now, if any of you guys have ever had soft shell crab before, check that out. That is a, a crab, a blue crab that is recently molted, okay? Oh, let me go back. So, thanks guys. So that is a blue crab that's recently molted. If you've ever eaten, oh, hold on. Scary guys. Still getting used to going back and forth on this thing. <laughs> Should have embedded it. Thanks for your patience. Okay. So if you've ever eaten soft shell crab, okay, that is a blue crab that is recently molted. That's when the um, fishermen are targeting them. It's so funny because every now and then you might get, a, get some blue crab that maybe molted a little too long ago and you can kind of taste the excess skeleton, which is a little strange. So you want that freshly molted blue crab, okay? Now I'm gonna stop my share because I have a couple things to show you. So this, is a molt, I have to be very careful with it. Check this baby out. So this is a molt of one of our spiny lobsters from the aquarium, okay? And every time um, uh, they grow a little bit, they'll, they have to molt, okay? So believe it or not, this isn't even full grown of one of these spiny lobsters, but really, really amazing molt. And what they'll do is they actually pop their body here and they pull their body through the back of the carapace here. Now this part is actually the abdomen. So if any of you guys eat lobster tail, you're actually eating lobster abdomen. This is the tail right here, okay? Yes, the shell does grow back. So once they pull out of this, okay, then basically the shell um, will take calcium particles from the ocean and harden up. It usually takes about two days. So they're pretty vulnerable after they, they molt to predators. So they'll typically go and hide. Now, if these guys lose any of their limbs or segments, it will grow back as soon as they molt, which is really wild to think about too. So to me, it's one of nature's greatest phenomenons, okay? Just a couple of fun facts about the lobster. They actually have taste buds on the end of their little legs here. So when they're looking around for stuff, and I actually, I wanna show you guys this. I just got this this morning, which is really cool. A Heather Hooper who takes care of many of our invertebrates. She just gave me this. So this is uh, the most recent molt of that same lobster. So again, she molts a couple times a year and she's a female. And right here is where her eggs will be. And the females have a different type of leg and they have these special little ends of their legs that they use to fan their eggs when they have them. So the males just have like a round leg. I literally got this this morning, so I had to share with you guys. Kind of cool, okay? Now, the molts are really fragile, okay? So they will biodegrade, whereas a seashell, like a clamshell, uh, will take 
thousands of years to, to biodegrade, whereas those guys pretty quickly, that's why you're not finding a lot of molts when you go to the, to the beach, because eventually they're gonna break down. Now I do have a special guest to show you. That is an arthropod. So let me just get him out for you. Okay. So I don't want to keep him out of the water too much. I'm just going to lift him up so you can see him. This is a little decorator crab. And you can see he actually has a little sponge stuck on his snout. Okay. Oh, sorry, buddy. He's like, what's happening? Let me put him back in the water. Okay. And that's a cool thing that a lot of our invertebrates do for camouflage is they'll actually decorate themselves. And let me see if I can show you him now. See if you can see it. You might not be able to. Yeah, you can see him a little bit there. Oh, there he is. So when he grows, every time he grows, he's going to molt that shell. Oh, it is a boy. Good job. You can see that carapace. He's got kind of a pencil shape on his um on what's called his apron and what they'll do is they will camouflage themselves with stuff they find out in the wild okay so he has a little sponge on him if he was to find a bunch of seagrass or seaweed he might put that all over himself make himself look nice and camouflaged okay there is another type of sea creature that does that also that we'll talk about here in a little bit all right, everybody say goodbye to my little fib or my little decorator crab. He did a good job. You can see those, those uh, jointed appendages, those jointed legs. I could do a whole class on crabs. Okay, awesome. All right, let me go back. So the arthropod. And these are, most of the marine ones are crustaceans. They are your shrimp. They are your crabs. They are your horseshoe crabs, um, which aren't crustaceans, but uh, spiders and insects also belong to these. So you can see why they are such a huge group of animals. All right, next one is phylum echinodermata. Echinodermata. <laughs> Derm means skin like a dermatologist, and echino means spiny or spiky, okay? So these guys typically have spiny or spiky skin. These guys are only marine. They're only found in the ocean, so you're not gonna find them on land. These guys have that radial symmetry, okay? So they make a, um, a circle, okay? So they can be divided into five equal parts, okay? not saying do that please don't do that <laughs> but they um that's their their body plan right now these guys don't have blood they don't have muscles they have what's called a water vascular system they basically suck in water through a, a part of their body and they're actually actually able to pump that through their body comes out of their tube feet and they can actually walk around uh, using that tube feet that tube feet is so they're so so strong that it's almost like super glue, okay? Like they just attach themselves. Many of these animals have to, they are, live in the intertidal zone. So they live right where tides are coming in and out. So not so much here in Sarasota, but say on the West Coast in California where it's very rocky, where the waves are really, really um, intense, okay? Imagine if you're a little, little sea star or something uh, sitting on that rock and a big wave comes those tube feet allow them not to go anywhere, okay? So they can actually handle those changing in tides, okay? They're really amazing animals. So here, these are your sea stars, your sea urchins, your sea cucumbers, your sand dollars, believe it or not. Sand dollars are actually just flattened out. Um, uh, sea urchins, believe it or not. And sea biscuits are kind of like fat, uh, fat, uh, Sand dollar. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. <laughs> so I want to stop the share because I want to show you I have two special guests that are echinoderms. Okay. But first thing though is I want us to all do a little activity. So everybody take your hands and hold them up like this. Okay. So even though our hand doesn't make a perfect circle, you can still kind of get the idea from it that uh, this is radial symmetry or five part symmetry, five equal parts, okay? So you think about your 
sea stars, okay, so they're not fish, so we don't really say starfish anymore. So if you put your hands together, you've got your starfish. You close them up, you've got your sand dollar, okay, five part, okay, sand dollar, okay, which are very important to our environment, boys and girls. You would never want to remove a sand dollar from the environment. Um, I know when I was a kid, I didn't know any better and I would take them, um, but they're really important filter feeders of our sand, okay. So we've got our sand dollar, or our sea star, our sand dollar, we've got our sea urchin, and then finally our sea cucumber. A lot of people don't realize that sea cucumbers also have radial symmetry, okay. Sea cucumber, sea urchin, sand dollar, sea star. Okay, do it five times fast. <laughs> All right, so I have two echinoderms to show you. The first one, Okay, it's a type of urchin. Okay, so I'm not gonna keep them out of the water long. I just wanted you to get a good look at them. So the sea urchins, this is a pencil sea urchin. Okay, name from, of course, his pencil-like spines or spikes. They can actually move those spines or spikes. They cannot see the way we do, echinoderms can't, but they can detect light. So everybody do me a favor, close your eyes, and then take your hand, and go over your eyes. Can you tell when your hand is over your eyes? Yeah, well, it kind of depends on how bright the room is that you're in, right? Okay. But that's kind of how these echinoderms see. They can't really see like us, but they can detect changes in light. Okay, so we've got that little guy, and then I wanna show you another. I'm gonna put him back. Goodbye, Mr. Urchin. Oh, let me show you real quick. They do have their mouths on the bottom, and he has five teeth, okay? It's called an Aristotle's lantern, which is kind of, I love the name, okay? Um, and they use that to eat algae. Some of them are predatory. These guys like a little bit of meat. Now I'm gonna show you guys the most vicious animal in all of our touch tank, okay? A highly predatory species that is in a separate container. Oh, he's trying to escape. Hey, buddy. Okay, so this is our, is our Bahama sea star, also known as a cushion sea star. And you can really see that five part symmetry. Guys, on the top, they have something known as a madreporite. That's where they suck that water in that they can then move their tube feet. So these are all their little tube feet. These guys are so strong, okay? I'm gonna put him back because I, get one good look. I don't want to keep them out of the water long. These guys are so strong that what they'll do is that they don't have blood and they don't have muscles, okay? So imagine if you're a marathon runner, but your muscles never build up lactic acid, so you literally never get tired. You could run for days and days and days. Well, that's kind of like a sea star. They're like the ultimate marathon runner, but typically used to open up a clam. Okay, so like I've got my clam here. So what a sea star will do, a predatory sea star, they'll wrap around the clam and then they'll just slightly pull, 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 pull until eventually they pull it open just a little bit. Look at this little guy. Then they throw up their stomach. You heard me right, throw up their stomach. Try to do that um, for dinner tonight. Oh, just leave it on your plate. Just put your stomach on the plate. Weird, right? So they'll put their stomach in there. They'll digest within the clam and then suck all the clam juice and everything back into their body. Pretty wild. Sea stars are amazing, okay? A little, oh, something down there. So the sea stars, the marathon runners, okay? So those are our echinoderms. Go back to share. You guys are doing great. How's that classification sheet coming along? Should be pretty easy for you. If not, keep on working. And last but not least is the phylum mollusca. Okay, so these guys also have that shelled, um, that, sorry guys, I'm gonna plug back something in, give me two seconds. 
so they also have a soft squishy body that would make a nice tasty treat for an animal out in the ocean right so most of them have a hard shell okay and that will grow as they grow okay they don't all have a hard shell so just a second we'll talk about the ones that don't but typically these are your snails these are your clams okay these are your oysters okay many of them many of your bivalves are sessile they don't move around think about a clump of oysters but some aren't so this particular bivalve so two shells like a bicycle has two wheels okay this bivalve is a scallop a bay scallop they are an indicator species so they indicate the health of the environment they cannot tolerate a lot of pollution they need very clean water so the presence of them really um, indicates to us a nice healthy environment now these guys as far as i know are the only bivalve that can swim okay so i'm going to show you a video and again i'm sorry if a if an ad pops up i'll learn for next when time when i first saw this product i thought it looked kind of crazy didn't really i don't endorse what this whatever be, it is but, uh, okay skip that <laughs> okay Okay, so you can see he must be out scalloping and he goes to grab it and he swims right away. So I just love it. You can see in that turtle grass bed, he's gonna go to catch it one more time. And he's out of there. I mean, scallops are my favorite bivalve. Doesn't everyone have a favorite bivalve just like me? I hope so. <laughs> uh, you'll also notice they have all of those eyes. Now, for years, we have thought that they, they saw the same way as the echinoderms um, and that their eyes were just picking up light. I just learned from one of our benthic ecologists, so, bottom, so benthic is bottom of the seafloor, that they think the eyes actually can see a little bit more the way we see. So there's still a lot of studies. So just such a cool like thing to think about how science is always changing and we're always learning, but now we think that they can actually see pretty well. So now I do have a couple of mollusks here to show you. And I have two snails. So I have this guy here, who is a lightning whelk, okay? Soft, squishy body. And the way most of these guys eat is they have what's called a radula on the end of their, on the end of their um, uh, mouth that they almost eat like a, a nail file. They almost like dig in, like, I don't know, file their food away and then slurp it out. So these are predatory snails, the lightning whelks. And then the other one I wanted to show you real quick maybe he sucks into the bottom is a florida crown conch okay so you can see that soft squishy body known as the foot this is called the operculum which is like the trap door and then this shell will grow as the animal grows and when the animal passes away then the shell is left and then there's a certain little arthropod that will come and take over. Any guesses which arthropod it is? A hermit crab, you got it. So hermit crabs are technically arthropods that have taken over a mollusk shell. Good job. Good job, little guys. All right, well, I gotta say, my friends did a great job and now my table is soaking wet, but that's fine. <laughs> Hermit crab. All right, I'm going to go back to my share screen. We are almost out of time. My fingers are now wet, you guys. Not good. Okay. So the cephalopods, again, just like the polychaetes are a class of the annelids, the cephalopods are a class of mollusks. Now, scientists believe that they have adapted ways to not have to have a shell, okay? So they can swim, they can ink, they're considered intelligent, they, have, um, they can learn, okay? 
my favorite thing about them is their ability to camouflage. So I have one more video to show you. Now, some of you guys may have seen this video before. It's my absolute favorite octopus video, but it just really shows. If you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to really- All right, just one second just really shows that ability. Now this is a TED talk from an octopus biologist. So check so this guy out. You need to really understand how to use your surroundings to hide. In the next scene, you're gonna see a nice coral bottom. And you see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change color and texture. Here's some algae in the foreground and an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, Roger spooked him, so as he took off, the cloud of ink lands, and when he lands, the octopus says, okay, I've been seen, best thing to do is get as big as I can get. That big brown makes his eye spot very big. So he's bluffing, let's do it backwards. I thought he was joking when he first showed it to me. I thought it was all graphics. So here, here it is in reverse. Watch the skin color, watch the skin texture. Just an amazing animal can change color and texture to match the surroundings. Watch him blend right into this algae. One, two, three. <laughs> Pretty incredible, huh? I love that video. Um, so they don't necessarily need that shell, right? They um, can do all those other things. So octopus are amazing. That particular species is octopus vulgaris that we do have out in Sarasota Bay. Okay, so how did you guys do on your big six classification challenge? Were you able to fit all of those animals into the right area? I will show you mine, okay? And you may see that I forgot to include Nidarian. <laughs> so sorry, little Nidarians. I feel bad that I left you off, but our anemones are coarse. So I just drew them in, okay? So take some time. If you don't have um, this today, uh, go back to the Flipgrid, check it out, and try your hand at classifying those marine invertebrates. Good job. So I have just a couple more things to share with you because the inverts, oh, this is cool because this is like, um, if you find a mystery creature, you can use these classifications. So let's look at this, guys. What do you think? It's a soft body, squishy, that can ink. What group do we think it belongs to? Yeah, it's a mollusk. It's a sea hare. Oh, I love. Now, sea hares can actually, um, they're, they're really, really like, they're survivors. They can thrive in low oxygen. Um, and so if there's a red tide that comes through, a lot of times um, the sea hares will actually thrive. And if we see a bunch of those, uh, then we might know that a red tide might be coming pretty soon. Now, inverts are so important. We've already kind of talked about how abundant they are, but they are just, I mean, look at this. This is that krill, okay? So the most abundant animal on the planet, the most biomass on the planet, okay? So important to so many things that eat it, okay? But also important for all sorts of other things. Like this is a cleaner shrimp. Like check him out. He's cleaning the teeth and the gills and the skin of all these fish, okay? So really, really important part of our marine ecosystem. And of course, they're important to us too, right? We eat them, okay? Um, it's part of our economy, okay? Uh, uh, really, you know, Florida runs on this, okay? But that can cause some problems. So there's one particular um, type of animal it's a crustacean, an arthropod, that we eat a ton of, that unfortunately, if you don't practice sustainability or you don't get it from the right place, it causes something called bycatch. Now, I'm sorry, I should have warned you guys about these images because they're kind of graphic, okay? Now, all of this stuff, basically, if you are targeting shrimp, everything that you catch that's not shrimp is called bycatch, okay? It can be really bad. Back in the 80s, dolphins were getting really, were, um, bycatch from tuna okay it was a big big deal luckily now tuna is dolphin safe tuna that's where that comes from okay it's because they were bycatch there is a marine mammal known as the vaquita that is highly critically endangered because of bycatch from a certain fish okay now shrimp is a pretty big culprit of that okay so if you guys have i just want to do a quick activity for you so 
if you have, I asked you to get some beans and stuff to represent different animals, a clear container, okay? If you want to, I'm not gonna do it today for, per, for to save time, but you can make it look like can make it look like seagrass. So I was going to tape this on the front of my container. I'm putting my little seagrass bed, okay, in there that we made last week, okay. And then this is going to represent my shrimp trawl, okay. So basically these big, big commercial shrimp industry, what they'll do is they take a net and they drag it across the seafloor in all these seagrass beds. And of course they get and sell the shrimp, but for every one pound of shrimp, it's estimated that there are 10 pounds of bycatch, okay? So that's 10 times the amount of animals that are dying for no reason, okay? So what you can do, if you wanna practice this, make a key like we did last time. So my big beans are gonna represent my uh, dolphins and marine mammals. My tiny lentils are gonna represent my shrimp. And then everything else is just going to be various animals. I've got seahorses in there, which is a really big um, uh, component of bycatch. Okay, a lot of seahorses, unfortunately, um, die from the shrimp industry. So, for my animals, and without looking, what you guys are going to do is you're going to take your net or your cup, and you're going to run it along the bottom of your sea floor and see what you catch. Now, your goal is to only catch shrimp. You guys, look at that. I mean, I have all these other things. I have like five dolphins in there. Now that doesn't happen always, of course, this is exaggerated, but this just really goes to show you how easy it is for bycatch to happen, okay? So, what you guys can do is you can su support sustainable seafood, Okay, so if you um, download the Seafood Watch app by Monterey Bay Aquarium, it will let you know uh, what is safe to eat, okay, as far as seafood and shrimp. So you want to support small shrimp um, organizations, okay, so little mom and pop shops, or you want it to be raised in a sustainable aquaculture facility. So if you want to eat shrimp, to do it right, you're gonna have to do some research, okay? Things like endless shrimp, no, okay? If it's a restaurant that is like, eat all the shrimp you can, they are probably not practicing sustainable seafood and there's probably a ton of bycatch going on, okay? So that's one thing that we can do, okay? Now my favorite seafood, ladies and gentlemen, is snow crab legs. I love it, I love snow crab legs. Unfortunately, guys, the fishery of, of snow crab are causing whales to get entangled, right, whales? So I have chosen to not eat it anymore until they can figure out a better way to catch the snow crab, okay? So again, it's all about your choices, all about figuring out what you can do to coexist, right? Because we want to still be able to eat seafood. We want to still support our seafood farmers, our fishermen, right? Everyone needs to make a living, but we want to do it sustainably. We want to make sure we are not harming that ocean. So I encourage you to really look into it and uh, think about the things that you're eating and share that with your parents, okay? Talk about it, right? Have a conversation about it. That's all we can do. Uh, one thing too to discuss, guys, whenever I talk about marine invertebrates, I love to talk about uh, collecting shells on the beach. Like I told you guys earlier, when I was a kid, I would go out, I would collect sand dollars. I'm not going to tell you how I would preserve them because it's really sad. I had no idea that they were alive. So if you find one in the sandbar that is kind of fuzzy, and maybe it's little two feet are moving around, it's alive. You wanna put it back and you wanna put it with its mouth side down because they can't flip, okay? And that's gonna help, help out the marine ecosystem. But another thing you guys can do is use your voice, use your dollars. You don't wanna go on what I like to call the evil stores of death. I don't know <laughs> which are these huge like touristy shops that sell all the different shells 
Here's a nice example of a really common one that you'll find is the, the queen conch. Now these are highly endangered, but a lot of stores will sell them, okay? What you don't realize when you go to these stores is many of them have been harvested and unfortunately killed just so you can have a nice souvenir, okay? So if you go to these stores, ask them, where did you get it, okay? Or have your parents ask them, right? So you just want to use your dollars wisely. We don't ever want to contribute to harming our oceans, okay? You guys are my ocean warriors, and you're the ones that are going to save our planet. And we need to teach other people how important these marine invertebrates are, okay? And I have all the faith that you can that we're going to save it. So thank you guys so much. That's all I have for you. I need to get my animals back to their, their the touch tank um, so they can go and have a nice break. Uh, you guys definitely check out our Google Classroom. We still, they, my colleagues are adding stuff every day, okay? So if you need a really fun STEM activity, you need, I mean, all sorts of stuff, visit this Google Classroom and check it out, okay? Now we only have two more classes left, so next week's all about oceanography, so we'll be talking about those abiotic factors in the ocean, and then the next week, of course, because we're at Moat, I had to end on sharks, so our last class will be all about sharks, okay? So if you guys have any questions or anything, please feel free to email me at any time, missdana at moat.org. Go out there, guys, save the world, save the planet, no big deal, and maybe have a little fun and learn a little something too. So I'll just stop my share. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us, and I will see you next week for At Home with Oceanography.